Lisa Kelly. I am your host for today's Creative Mornings, and uh, thanks for the coffee, and thank you for having me. Um, where, we're ours, where we are is pretty cool because uh, we're in an art gallery, and I tend to think of a lot of what I do making games as actually being art, um, and how it affects people in similar ways. Pushing buttons, I shouldn't, sorry. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the topic is game, uh, and I'm here to talk with you a little bit about how games have changed my life in particular. Um, I did a thing, I turned games into my full-time job, which is uh, not something most people do. Uh, and I could tell you about how I did that in very, very excruciating detail, but um, that's not really fun. So <laughs> what I'm going to be talking about instead is a little about what I learned about the costs of um, being what I would call uh, the boss of fun. <laughs> so <laughs> this is an image from one of our games. Uh, it's a cat from a superhero game that we have, which is called Masks. Uh, this is a, a villain, if you can't tell. Um, <laughs> so basically, what I've done is I've structured my life uh, around playing and making tabletop role-playing games. Um, what is that, you might wonder. So a tabletop role-playing game is uh, basically someone reads a rule book, one person hopefully at least, uh, and they will be your <coughs> storyteller, dungeon master, uh, game master, uh, GM, as I'll probably refer to it a lot, so forgive my uh, acronyms. Um, and then they are going to tell you what the world is like based on the setting in the book, the rules in the book, all of that. Everybody else has a character sheet that helps them play and embody their character at the table. And they uh, interact with the world as the GM describes it, and then if there, when there are conflicts, depending on the types of conflicts the game highlights, you roll dice or uh, pull cards or do some other resolution mechanic to figure it out. But it's generally a very storytelling type of game. D&D um, &D is one of the most popular, if you've ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons or watched Stranger Things. This is <laughs> the, biggest, uh, <laughs> the biggest one um, of our, in our industry. Um, so it's a very small industry, but uh, it's even smaller within games, um, and that's what I do. Um, so uh, yeah, some of you might remember like the um, Satanic Panic of the 80s. Um, I don't actually worship Satan in a basement. Basements are really hard to come by in New Mexico, so so you know we we'll work work around it. Um, so uh, my company is Magpie Games. Um, we started in uh, 2011. Uh, my partner Mark and I uh, wanted to make games because we played them a lot and it was our hobby. And we thought we had a lot of ideas and that this would be really neat. Um, we, had, uh, we entered a competition called Game Chef where you make like a mini game using ingredients like like Iron Chef or some of the, the other shows. So you, you, they give you a list of words and then you have to make a game out of it. And so our first game was published from that. Um, since then we've made, a, we're coming up on about 30 titles for our company and uh, we have a whole team of people. We have employees, we work with freelancers regularly um, and uh, we have some of our titles published in other languages in other countries. Um, and what we do is more of the tabletop role-playing games. So just like D&D, you're gonna be uh, rolling dice and describing the world and figuring out what's going on. Um, few people uh, actually get to pay folks to do what we do um, for a living. So we're pretty proud of the fact that we uh, have uh, a bunch of actual employees who are doing this full time, people who are passionate about it. Um, we have, uh, we have like lots of, like I said, lots of the freelancers that we work with. We actually work with fairly regularly. Um, and most of the time, a lot of people treat this uh, as a hobby, even when they're designing and producing products for it. Um, so as, we think about 
making role-playing games as art. Um, we do think of ourselves as artists quite a bit, um, but we think we have a lot to do all along the way of making these products and doing games. The bottom line is that like, we have a lot of responsibilities when it comes to taking care of people who make the games, the people who play the games, and uh, everyone in between. Um, and sometimes it's actually uh, a little hard to figure out where the line is when fun is a, me a measurement. <laughs> so when we're working with people um, who are trying to give us feedback on games, for example, uh, I might give, ask for some feedback and they'll be like, well, I had a lot of fun. I'm like, that's great, but that is almost completely useless data to me. <laughs> and that's uh, a lot of it because um, some of what I think is like, Fun is not quite fun, so you need to actually get good. <laughs> um, it's not enough for me to make a game that's fun for people because um, a lot of people actually are really good at making their own fun. They're generally playing with their friends who are, <laughs> are fun. <laughs> and uh, uh, what I want to know more is, did I do, did everything work as I planned? Did you have the type of fun that I thought you might have? Um, did the systems fail or break underneath you and you sort of glossed over them because you're, you know, really good at rolling with the punches? Um, and so we, as designers and publishers, spend an enormous amount of time uh, making sure that other people don't spend their time making their own fun. Um, players, uh, <coughs> Players don't have a problem with that, <laughs> usually. Um, and uh, I think a lot about how, um, how there are a lot of games that are okay at delivering fun. So what I set out to do is go above and beyond that and not just stop at giving your fun. So if you think about the last movie you watched that was just okay, right, or um, like the last uh, game you played that was just okay. And did it move you? Like, was it the kind of art you would have wanted to give to other people? Like if you were the one who made it? Was it the kind of art you would tell your friends about? The biggest point here I think is that the world we live in right now doesn't really have time for mediocre work. And to deliver on a bigger, uh, goal of having art or moving people or inspiring people, you actually have to get really good. Um, and generally that's going to mean working really, really hard for a really, really long time. Um, it, it is so much work <laughs> that if I told you or me how much work it would actually be, you would just nope out right there. <laughs> like, nope. Uh, our brains are really good at, at not thinking about that ahead of time so that you actually do complete these monumentous <laughs> tasks and you do put out game after game, but it is, it is really long and it is really hard. Um, and you need to want to do it longer than makes any sense. <laughs> um, you have to need, you need to want it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about talent versus skill. So if you have the desire to keep going and doing your, your games forever, um, these are a couple games that I've worked on. This is the plays of thing. This was our first game that we put out. And this is 7C, second edition, which is a mega hit in our industry. Um, this, uh, for just for an example, on Kickstarter, this one raised $5,000. This one raised 1.3 million. So I kind of bring up that because that number blew my mind too when it happened. <laughs> we were not expecting that. Um, but with that came a lot of different challenges and different things. So over the past seven years, uh, I've been doing this. Uh, I've been getting a lot better at doing it, but my talent never changed. So talent to me is not the same as skill. So 
Being good at what you do isn't good enough, and being talented has very little to do with getting good. <laughs> so when, when I think about, oh, is it enough to just make games and put them out there and that's that, I think the answer is no, because if there's one thing I have learned, it is that uh, you, there is so much more to discover. Um, I was glazing over a whole bunch of jobs. You're maybe doing a whole bunch of jobs that you didn't know existed. So for this one, I was actually the artist for this book, and I did all the art in it, and I planned it all out. Um, in this one, I'm the art director for the book. I didn't know I was, that was like a thing when I made this book. And today it is one of the things I do full time is make as art direct for a bunch for this for 7C in particular. And like you might like both of these covers. They're, they're fine. They're nice. Um, this one is tattooed on someone's flesh somewhere. Like that's nice. But what happened here? <laughs> What happened here is a lot of our graphic designer, our layout artist, who was like, oh, you made a picture, that's nice. I'm going to turn it into a cover. <laughs> and he just did that. Daniel Solis was very kind. He laid out our whole book. Uh, he was one of the first people we met in the industry. Uh, and it, it worked out really well. This one, with that big price tag, uh, <laughs> came along a demand for me to step up my skills. I'd already been doing art direction for a while when this came along, but I still had to level up again, if you will. And I, as, as with the price tag, you have a whole bunch of more constraints and demands that are all behind the scenes. Um, I have, um, not only do I have to art direct a book, like, or, or two, but now I have to figure out how to design an entire line of 12 books, right? What does the cover dress look like? What does, how do the covers signal what they're doing? How do we make sure that all the colors, covers look similar? Um, how do we differentiate covers when we're trying to signal different things? Um, for example, all of the 7C core books have two heroes surrounded by a dangerous foe. Um, the supplements all have two heroes surrounded by allies. It's a very subtle difference, um, but even the structure of the back of the book is different. I have two strips on the back of this book with two different images that have nothing to do with each other, and then text in the middle. All of the supplements have a wraparound cover that stops halfway through, so I need to make sure that the art that's commissioned doesn't have anything uh, where the spine would be that's important. All of these tiny little details, <laughs> when I made this, I, that wasn't even on my radar. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't care, and it worked out. Like, that's, f that's great. But I learned a lot, and a lot of it was painful amount about my own shortcomings, but, <laughs> um, but on that note, <laughs> Uh, I went to the Gamma Trade Show with my partner Mark uh, this last year, and it was the first time we had been there. Uh, the Gamma Trade Show, uh, usually we go to con like conventions, uh, you'll hear a lot for gaming. Um, that's where you can sell things, you can be a vendor, uh, you can uh, run your games for fans and, all, and have a lot of fun. This is a trade show for the industry side. So it's a lot of people who are either manufacturers, they're distributors, they're retailers. Um, and uh, for the past seven years, Smagpie Games has been trucking along. We're uh, doing everything we can to make great games, we meet, meet a better, better audience. Um, we work very hard to make the quality of our games uh, super high and uh, both in production value and in mechanics. But we were sort of seeing that we couldn't quite um, level up again. We couldn't quite get to the next stage. We sort of started to see a plateau in our, uh, in our growth because we had grown a lot and then we kind of just stopped growing as much. Um, 
So Mark and I were wandering around the halls of Reno, uh, and I was kind of dumbfounded because I thought to myself, how have I never come to this before? It like, <laughs> blew my mind. Uh, we chatted about, we've chatted with uh, retailers and distributors uh, for advice about how to get where we were going, and mostly we got the response that was like, oh, your books are gorgeous and the mechanics are fantastic. We hear great things. You're really cute. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So we pushed on them, and their answer was eventually, oh, so you're serious, you, want, you really want to know. <laughs> um, well, you need to grow up, not level up. And you need to do what other companies do, what are the big companies do. You need to pursue licenses, look at your form factor, you know, do what retailers and distributors want, a whole, whole list of things. We were already doing everything we could do at the scale and for what we were doing. We, we couldn't grow just doing the same thing, making these really great games greater <laughs> and making them prettier and making them, you know, appeal to that much audience. We weren't reaching that next step of bigger, broader audience. And we, what we heard was incredibly painful uh, it was earth-shattering and so necessary. Uh, what we needed to do was get good. And we already knew all of this, but it just sort of clicked into place. When, when we were there, the atmosphere was right. Maybe we had really felt like we tried everything for the first time. But for whatever reason, the stars lined, and it really clicked this time. Um, and I still couldn't help but wonder, why have I never been here before? <laughs> so, when we started Magpie Games, uh, like I said, Mark did uh, the writing uh, and of the game, and I did a lot of the, um, uh, the art, and it was pretty straightforward, right? Uh, Mark had already owned a business before, so I didn't have to learn all that from scratch. Um, and over the years, I learned a lot about how to make things better. Um, but I also learned that that relationship wasn't going to work. Um, it was more of a it was more of a freelancer sort of situation where I was employee, and Mark was an employee. We weren't actually doing bigger, broader things like we wanted to. We weren't making the higher level art that we really thought we could. So I was doing a lot of jobs um, uh, for freelance, learning a lot more. Uh, I did uh, a lot of jobs <laughs> while we were making our next games. Uh, and we were you know, always trying new things and doing new things. Um, but. Basically, um, what I started to do more than anything was uh, art direction for other companies. And like I mentioned with all the constraints and new crazy things with 7C, one of the things that popped up was uh, this book, uh, New World. It's one of the supplements for 7C. And basically, what I do as an art director is I figure out how many pieces need to be in the book, how big they need to be, what they need to have in them. I write down what, they need, what the artist should draw. I hire artists. I work with them on approvals and edits, and then I deliver the final art assets for the book. Um, I also do a lot of other things as senior art director. I work with the layout artist to make sure that the line looks, looks good and that there are no issues or problems in the proofing process. Um, but for... New World, um, players get to adventure as heroes from a whole bunch of places uh, that are analogous to uh, real world Mesoamerica. And Zatkan is one of the fictional nations based on the Maya. And it was very important for all of us at the team to represent, even though it's a very fictional nation, <laughs> to represent them with respect and care. And so there were lots of eyes on the project. We had a bunch of consultants. We had a bunch of developers. We had um, a bunch of people helping get it to where it needed to be. And um, this book alone was balancing 10 times 
the constraints that the core book did. Uh, the core book had an existing line that I could just pull from. Uh, we were just reinventing, uh, polishing up a wheel and putting it out there. Um, but this one was a whole new, uh, a whole new world. And uh, it was really uh, great because I had to pay attention to even more than most of our other supplements because I had to care about what materials uh, their jewel the character's jewelry was made out of. Uh, what style their hair was, the pattern of dress, the architecture uh, adornment, the edits, the, consult, uh, the consultant approvals, and then the more edits. So each of these we wanted to make distinct and clear. I managed uh, 10 or so artists and commissioned over 74 images for this book. And when it was all done, <laughs> my best friend Anastasia, uh, she's a Maya archeologist uh, who worked on the book, and uh, she, she takes me aside and she goes, uh, you know what's crazy about this book? I'm like, you mean the book that consumed about eight months of our lives completely and utterly? <laughs> um, she said, uh, some of the scenes we depict in the images uh, haven't been depicted in popular media since about like 1080. And that brings me to, like, we make games, and you imagine no one would care <laughs> because uh, what we do is small, right? Well, for me, I, I, I feel yes, but not quite. I think storytelling and pl through storytelling and play, uh, people can hope. Uh, it can make them... Uh, think about people other than themselves. It can inspire them uh, and inform their everyday decisions. Not that it always does or should, just that it can, just like any other kind of art. Um, and for me, it's not good enough to just show up and make a game. Uh, you have to do what you do to benefit a community of people and the people that you're reaching and trying to reach. Uh, expressing yourself is great as an artist, but I believe that creators and artists have the responsibility to lift other people up. Uh, I remember the first interaction I had uh, with a fan, like an actual fan, was I was standing in line at Starbucks uh, at a convention, Gen Con. It was very busy. Uh, I was grabbing a banana and a really bitter coffee, because those are my options for breakfast. <laughs> Um, and spending like five minutes quality time with some other uh, designers and, and industry folk because standing in line at Starbucks is just about as much time as you're gonna get with somebody <laughs> at a show like that. Um, and he, they we're talking and someone in my group mentions my name and this gentleman turns around and he goes, I overheard you, are you Marissa Kelly who made the dragon game, Papillion? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like looking around confused because there are a lot of more like awesome people surrounding me <laughs> that are really much more famous than I am. Um, and he goes, can I take a picture of you? My home group would be like over the moon and uh, I don't have my book so I can't have you sign it. And um, so I'm living the dream, right? Well, generally, I despise fame. <laughs> like, uh, even the modest amount that I have in the small, like, as a small star in a very small industry, uh, as kind and gracious as that fan was, I think he finally helped me start to grasp why it's being, like, having any kind of fame left a bad taste in my mouth. And... Uh, that's because it meant a lot of responsibility. So for me, growing up as a poor kid in the North Valley here, um, I had never had to worry about what I said. Like, I could just be me, I could be harsh, I could be crude, I could be distasteful, I could be wrong, I could be stupid, <laughs> um, and I could just be me. And, but I'm the boss now. <laughs> the boss of fun, sure, but I have power. And 
That means I have a lot of worries. I have to worry about uh, how I lead my teams. I have to worry about, uh, uh, I have to nurture people's ideas. I have to facilitate fun. Um, and I have to worry about the things I'm not worrying about. <laughs> so that carefree version of me, the one who didn't care um, about anything but being true to herself and her dreams, um, well, it turns out I do care. <laughs> and I care about my impact on other people and the actions that I take that might uh, either nurture them or, or tear them down. And while I still care about the, being the carefree and true to myself, uh, I'm the boss now and I have a responsibility. Um, so when I was on the uh, plane back home for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, I think it was last year. I was chatting with my mom about me as a level one paladin. And uh, she, she tells me that my second grade teacher knew I would be a writer because I was so creative and weird and had weird ideas. Um, I promptly repeated the second grade because I couldn't read. Um, but you know, she might have been onto something because if I look back into whatever crystal ball that she had um, to see uh, that I might become a game designer, writer, or producer, uh, I don't think I would have changed my path getting here. Uh, it's hard, it hurts, I hate fame, but the games we make aren't about me. The fun you have at the table isn't about me, and I love that. Having fun, <laughs> uh, this is an image from Urban Shadows, one of our games where you play a bunch of urban, uh, you play a bunch of uh, fantasy creatures, so like Buffy, so you can play a vampire or a werewolf or whatever, all in an urban city where you have debts and you're trying to, uh, to pull people around and uh, get them mixed up into your, into your antics, sort of like The Wire Meets Buffy. Um, <laughs> so. Although I hate that success uh, brings power, and uh, with power comes great responsibility, uh, I do have to remind myself, again, that it's not about me, it's about the fun. And whatever brand of fun you have, whether that's horror, romance, action, uh, it's my job as the boss to nurture that. And I really, that's all I've ever wanted. Uh, I want game to mean something different for every player, I want each player to bring their own experiences to the game, and I want to use games to empower more people to tell their stories. Most of all, uh, as the boss of fun, I want to give players the tools to make that magic happen. Um, and to do that, you should get a team. <laughs> um, you, can't do, you can't get there without a team, in my opinion. Um, and before you check this one off your list as complete, um, I don't mean building a team of people who do the parts of the project that you can't do. Those are called employees. They may be necessary, but they're not sufficient. <laughs> a team is not just made up of the people working for you. Uh, there are view and there are very few actual teams. There are lots of people claiming they're building teams, but they have never actually given up any control. It's really good. Uh, to really get good and seize your moment, uh, you need to build a real team, and that means really giving up control that you might have. <laughs> Making teams is hard. Uh, this is an uh, image from Bluebeard's Bride. It is a horror game uh, that we make. Uh, you play out the fairy tale where you wander room to room as the bride, um, trying to decide if your husband is uh, has uh, uncharitable, uh, if he's gonna kill you. <laughs> 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 or if you're a very faithful bride and you don't wanna go into the final room because he told you not to and, uh, and see how that goes for you. <clears throat> Doesn't end up well for you. <laughs> um, so giving up control is hard. Uh, building a team is hard, but it's absolutely worth it. Uh, teams grow faster than individuals can. 
Uh, teams complement individual skills and thoughts and ideas, and teams can spot things you can't. Uh, teams allow individuals to change and push each other's uh, ideas and productivity. So you might think that you've uh, got this down and you're like, oh, I'm really efficient. Well, you might not know how you could change your own self because you've already changed a lot. Yay, superheroes! I haven't seen Infinity War yet, but I want to hear all the spoilers afterwards, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, <laughs> this is from our game, one of our games called Masks. You play teen superheroes. Um, speaking of the difference between friends, employees, and team members, I was lucky enough to uh, have this dichotomy highlighted for me in like a strange duality. Uh, there was uh, the first time uh, during the development of this game, uh, there was a question, should Masks, the game, be set in a fictional city that Brendan, uh, the lead on it, made up, or should it remain open-ended so that players can just make up whatever uh, city they want? Uh, the first time this came up it was late night after convention in the hotel lobby, the bar had closed, we're draped over, tired over some armchairs, and uh, Brendan and a friend Rich and I uh, are chatting and Rich is saying that it should be open-ended and I'm politely disagreeing. The chat was engaging, but that's all it was. It was just a chat. Uh, basically, um, uh, Ken Height started telling duck jokes and it was over. <laughs> so days later uh, in Brendan's living room, uh, he and I are fighting about this. <laughs> um, See, when Rich, Brendan, and I are chatting, it's nothing more than a chat. Um, but when Rich isn't there, and it's not just a chat anymore. Uh, it's a discussion between two members of the team who have real control. This is Brendan and I collaborating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but all jokes aside, the, the fight is happening because change is actually on the line. Brendan didn't like end up, or Brendan did end up uh, making Halcyon City a core part of the game. Uh, it's a crucial and very important uh, linchpin or cornerstone for the game and its fans and everything that's come afterwards. And it's been really awesome. But he, we weren't fighting because Brendan didn't like my opinion. We were fighting because we were part of a team that actually had control of the product and that we were of uh, the decisions that were being made and that we were trying to actually move things forward. So when you have a team, you can take even bigger risks. This is our newest product, uh, Cartel. <laughs> it is about playing narcos in uh, Mexico, and it is important, it's controversial to some, and it is possible because we have a team. Um, while working on this project, uh, Mark, the lead, asked Miguel, one of our layout artists, to take a bigger role in the game, in the, in the team. And that meant he was coming in as a consultant because he lives in the area that the game is set. Um, so some of this process is super easy. He's like, hey, this slang is different here than it is where you are. Cool, note made, never do that mistake again, call it a day. But making Miguel part of a team means listening to the feedback <laughs> that is also really hard. So the way you, uh, are in, the way you conceptualize uh, how police work is wrong. It's just totally different. And that means that Listening to that feedback in that case meant that Mark had to rewrite and rework major parts of the game. And we did. Uh, because listening to things makes the project harder. Um, yes. <laughs> but it also makes it better. Um, so being the boss uh, of fun is just as rough as being the boss of anything else. And uh, I just want everybody to know that you don't have to do it alone, and it's much better if you don't. 
uh, and that the art that you all go out there and make, want to make sure that you know that you can do so much more than just express yourself. That you can reach other people. You can help your communities. You can uplift other artists. You are not just like a cog in a machine cranking out art and doing what you have to do to make the bills meet. Although that is also important to perpetuating that. <laughs> so thank you all so much for having me and listening to me chat. Uh, I can't wait for all the questions. <laughs>